So excellent. Thank you all for joining us, letting us let us know where you're coming from and one reason why you are passionate about this topic. Go ahead and put that in the chat. Thank you all. Welcome. So good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for attending today. And I hope that you have been enjoying Upswell 2021. And thank you again for attending the session as we are beginning to talk about extracting racism from resistance to persist, from resilience to persistence. I am Maria Maboni president and CEO of Achieve More LLC. We focus in on consulting, training, as well as leadership development and coaching. And, you know, when I think about the concepts of kind of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, we're going to be talking about how we honor identity and intersectionality. We're going to be focusing in on how we uncover uh, elements of exclusion and inclusion. We're also going to be highlighting the elements of resilience that we have continued to utilize to persist and also thinking about those avenues of persistence and the various pathways of support as we talk about how we extract racism. And so uh, as we asked you to, to, as you are joining here today, go ahead and put your, your name, um, let us know where you're coming from and one of the reasons that you are passionate about this topic. Excellent. Yes, thank you all so much. I see that those are coming through in the chat as well. And one of the key things also is as we walk away from today, we really want to begin to then think about, you know, overarching, what are the avenues that we need to follow to really extract racism, make sure that we are healing and continuing to persist. And so I'm going to now open with why I vent. Today I vent. I volunteer these thoughts to have that space in a special place. I vent because I'm confused. I, begin, I vent because I feel used. I vent because I'm tired. I vent because I'm often mired in other people's bullshit. I vent because I'm ignored. I vent because I'm bored in my own loneliness. I vent because other people's problems somehow become mine to solve about which I could give a damn. I vent because people think I'm a ham and don't recognize that I too am human and have feelings. I vent because I got verbally attacked today, yesterday, this week, last month, and subliminally slapped by a coworker, a boss, a loved one, the media, or a stranger. I vent because others keep confusing the facts about who I really am. So they do things and say things behind my back that always have me on attack. I'm tired and one day due to an untimely outburst, I might get fired and then I'll vent because I'm broke and I ain't had no good stroke or intimacy the way I truly need it. You know, sometimes it feels like I'm fighting an uphill battle in the world, moving from space to space, item to item, to-do list to to-do list, being directed like cattle. No one saying thank you, no one really recognizing or affirming my uniqueness. So now you see the bleakness of the situation. I vent because I'm hurt. I vent because I'm afraid. I vent because I feel like I'm drowning while other people keep clowning around and around and around each day, not taking this life or situation seriously. I vent because everything seems to be a joke, but I'm not fooling with these folks. So I vent, are y'all listening? Can anyone take a moment to hear me and ask me about how I feel, my emotions? Can anyone put their life on pause for five minutes to check in on my internal or external tears that ultimately display my underlying fears? Will anyone come near to hear my needs? Just ask me what I need, how I need it, where I need it, when I need it, and I'll share why. So I got to have that space and a special place to volunteer my emotions and needs through talking, vent. Or I just might lose my mind and be blind to the frustration boiling inside. 
Perhaps you are that place in which I can confide or should I just keep walking, searching for another? That's why I need that special place and that special space to sort it all out and okay, protected place to shout out loud my first thoughts and feelings. Then I can align my mind with my true intentions and not dwell on the anger that started to swell and get myself together so I can continue to be strong in this life with a coworker, a boss, a loved one, the media, or a stranger, and supremely happy with him forever in the next. That's why I vent. So I open with that because, you know, as we talk a little bit about racism, um, I wrote that poem that's at the front of my, my book and journal um, as I was commiserating weekly with several female colleagues um, of mine during the pandemic. And just as we had heard about the murder of Joy uh, of George Floyd and, and so many others. And so part of it is, you know, I, I am a social worker. Um, I'm licensed in two states, both Maryland and Virginia, and I live just outside of DC. And I think that it's important that as we are talking about these issues related to racism and how we extract racism, we also need to make sure that we provide the space for each other to talk about our emotions to talk about the needs that we have. And so often we, um, and I have found that as we're working through this, we don't really create that space. So thank you all very much. Thanks for the snaps in the chat as well. And it's just, again, my gift from God and my gift to you. So as we continue to move through, definitely, um, I wanna ask you all now, we're gonna go ahead and launch this, launch this poll in terms of what are your thoughts? You know, Do you feel like, um, addressing racial fatigue and dismantling uh, structures of power and privilege and unconscious bias are the DEI goals that organizations should be working toward. Go ahead, we're gonna launch that poll now. Let me know, let us know what you think. Would love to see your thoughts on that. So hopefully you all are seeing the poll here. Yes, thank you. Excellent, go ahead and vote right now. That would be great. Excellent, excellent. And then we're gonna go ahead and close the poll in just a minute. Go ahead and get your votes in. Great, and so we're gonna go ahead and close that poll and be able to show you what you all said. So yes, we do think um, overwhelmingly, it seems like, right? We're here at Upswell, right? But just wanted to, to kind of check and, and, get, and get the pulse of everyone. Um, and so you'll see here, you know, as we show you this poll, um, that this is some of the work that we know organizations need to be doing and really talking about the deeper issues, right? The, the, the underlying issues, the root issues um, related to DEI and wanted to make sure that we uh, could reflect in on that. So hopefully you all can see those results and we will continue to move on. And so as we think about the realities of racism, and I'm going to be asking you all to also go ahead and chime in in the chat. We're also going to have a chance to talk to each other as we move throughout to, to today's session as well. And so when we think about the realities of racism, right, let's, let's just highlight what some of those are, right? We know um, as it relates to bias and discrimination and harassment, we know how prevalent that is. We also know that the, the racial fatigue, the stress and the anxiety that we have continued to see um, around the realities of racism for centuries. And we also know that there is this increase as well in compassion fatigue, right? As we are continuing to explain and take care of other people, a lot of times we 
uh, neglect ourselves. And so the reality also that we see around racism is the microaggressions uh, and the increase in the microaggressions and the steady microaggressions, even so to the point where um, some recent studies have shown that a lot of people, uh, and especially Black people, uh, professionals, do not want to necessarily go back into the workplace because of the racism, the microaggressions, the comments, you know, all of the things that we have to deal with um, in the environment. And so just know that that um, new survey by the by Future Forum showed that just 3% of Black professional workers were ready to return to the office. That means 97% of the folks that they studied said that they did not want to go back to the office because of these realities that we have to continue to deal with. That's deep, y'all. That is really deep. And so in addition, we know that the, the other realities of racism um, are the internalized oppression and even internalized racism in terms of how we then trans, transfer some of that to our own people. Um, and we also then see the immense burnout that not only are we working through related to the pandemic, but also the centuries um, and years of elements connected to racism. And we are also uh, now also continuing to combat and battle with imposter syndrome, right? How many of y'all have seen that or know of a colleague who is dealing with burnout, imposter syndrome? Let me know in the chat. Let us know in the chat for those of you that are seeing this and witnessing this. Um, you know, the recognizing that we know we belong, but somehow in our minds, we um, have convinced ourselves or we allow other people to convince ourselves that we don't belong, right? And so that is that imposter syndrome. And then the triggers, right? The situations that have happened to us over time and how that shows up in our behaviors, in our actions, us being on guard um, or not, right? Or even at the other spectrum, sometimes being apathetic. Uh, because we're just tired of being tired. And so these are, again, the, the realities that we continue to see. Uh, we know the financial inequity. We also know that the pay inequity that is out there as well, um, and, and certainly the digital divide. And there are so many others. So what are some of the other realities of racism that you all um, see? You know, definitely feel free to come off of mute or put those in the chat. Um, and then I also hear, you know, I'm also seeing in the chat, the cultures that explicitly perpetuate it, absolutely. Any other realities that you wanna put out there? Yes, racial battle fatigue, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's where, um, you know, our good sister Angela Davis, who we know who has also been involved in um, Upswell, I don't know if many of you had a chance to attend the session um, not too long ago, you know, she says in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist, we must be anti-racist. And so the question is, what are we doing to root out racism? And we will come back and talk a little bit about that as well. And so as we move forward, wanted to make sure that we talk about these pathways of resilience, the ways in which that we have really um, continued to think about how then we remain resilient and what are the things that we have seen uh, and the strategies that we have used. And so um, I like this, this change agent, this change leader of uh, Jamal Turner, a colleague of mine, he talks about um, the fact that you know, to build an inclusive environment that allows individuals to reach their full potential is one of the things that we need to really strive towards and making sure that we as under, underrepresented folk sometimes need to continue to get involved and even at the highest levels of organizational governance to really begin to impact systems. We also know that we need majority folks to get involved as well. And so it's really through this resistance that we need to continue to be on the pathway of resilience. It's also how we continue to protect ourselves, uh, how we continue to protect others. Also recognizing that yes, it takes an immense amount of patience 
um, to really extract and, and root out racism and as well as the perseverance that's absolutely necessary. And, you know, overall, um, thinking a little bit more about that resistance, uh, you know, another change, change leader, Eloisa, you know, she talked about, again, making sure that we are thinking about these strategic plans and the way in which we use strategy to provide ammunition for accountability right and really how are we identifying the various metrics of success when we think about how we really want to extract racism and this is where i think again about the the resistance that's needed the reflection as well as the partnerships that are absolutely critical to be on this path and and when we think about the just the concept of an extraction you know y'all let me know in the chat what comes to mind when you think about extraction. You know, I think about, for example, extracting my tooth, right? It's, it, there, it's, there's an infection, there's something going on where the dentist has to literally go in and, and take that tooth out. You know, I know I've had four wisdom teeth removed um, and sometimes that can be painful, right? Um, but it has to come out because ultimately, we, uh, they fear that the infection will continue to spread. I also think about some of our action films where you know you see people are under fire and, and then the, the, the plane or the helicopter swoops in and has to come and extract the team out, right? And, and really get them out of the situation. And so these are some of the things that I think about um, in terms of when we talk about extracting racism and knowing that we also can do that through um, our persistence and our resilience as well. Uh, somebody said, damn, that, that Dennis image is real, right? Um, and you feel it, absolutely. And so we, we definitely know that we now is the time for us to begin to think about how we go to a greater level and go to that next level to really truly extract racism. And so part of it though, is also about you know, these avenues of persistence and recognizing how we have continued to persist through and to what ways and, and in what ways are we continuing to make sure that we are providing pathways of support. Um, for those of you that are connected to a faith or a faith community um, or, or not, right? Um, the power of prayer, I know for some people, really does help. Uh, we also have our collective power, right, where we can utilize the support of each other. We also have to recognize that we got to stay on point and on target, which means that we got to constantly pivot and change with the issues that we are contending with in our communities and in our various spaces and space, various spaces and places. And we also know that we have to continue to advocate. And so that's where another change leader um, that I so admire, Pamela Silas, she says, you know, overall, uh, when she, she does a lot of work in the Native community in the Chicago area, and she says, overall, Native women need to learn to become a powerful advocate for themselves. So that is also thinking about, again, how are we advocating for ourselves and doing that collectively with others? And just, again, making sure we are pivoting and staying on our game. And that's where I also think about the concept around um, how we serve as agitators. You know, that as well, in terms of when we think about extracting racism is important, um, that we need to be able to agitate the environment a little bit as well and call out the things that we know are not correct or that should not be happening. And how then are we also celebrating, celebrating the, the challenges that we have overcome, as well as thinking about um, how we seek allyship um, and or accept allyship rather from other groups and other people that want to be allies, true allies, right? Um, not just in name, but also in deed. And then also making sure that we have strategy um, that allows us to continue to really work through the systemic uh, and sometimes even systematic racism that we know is occurring. And so uh, I like this quote about allyship. 
as well by Emma Kuzden. You know, she talks about um, standing behind us when we need support, standing behind us when we need backup, and standing in front when we need protection. And want to encourage us to uh, continue to challenge others that say they want to be allies for them to actually show up as allies is important. And so um, as we move forward, let's then you know, have some conversation in terms of how are you rooting out racism? Um, what are some of the things that you are engaged in? And so I'm going to ask you, um, I was going to go ahead and uh, have us go into some small breakout rooms, uh, probably for about five or, or so, five to seven minutes or so, and then want to ask you all to come out of your breakout rooms, make sure that you have somebody who's willing to um, you know, be a recorder just to kind of highlight some of the themes uh, and then certainly want to ask you as well, you know, in, in ways that how are you rooting out racism? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and have y'all go into breakout rooms. We're going to do that for a couple of minutes and then come back out because I want to hear all of the themes that come out from our conversations. So I'm setting that up now. And we're creating those breakout rooms. There should be probably about two or three of you in each room. And just want to say thank you, everybody. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. A minute for All right, so welcome back everyone. Thank you so much for spending time together. Um, it was really important to make sure that we had some time to you know, exchange thoughts and ideas. So let us know, I wanna hear from you in terms of um, how are you rooting out racism? What are some of the themes you talked about? So go ahead and come off of mute um, and let's share for you know, a few minutes and then we're gonna wind down the session. So uh, Chevy, Emily, anybody, uh, I think you all were in a room together. What are your thoughts? Hi, this is Emily. Um, we were talking and actually Chevy specifically brought up the concept of um, kind of white dominant culture in professional culture and how we kind of mm. need to acknowledge that first of all and dismantle it. Um, and she specifically spoke around resistance management um, mm -hmm. as well as the concepts of, you know, on the one hand, achieving equity does not necessarily mean that those in power need to give anything up, but sometimes it does, and we should be open to that and acknowledge that it's, you know, oftentimes uh, more beneficial for everyone, including those people currently, um, you know, having a disproportionate amount of power to be able to give that up for the, for the greater good. Um, and we also spoke about Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say we also spoke about uh, supporting Black and BIPOC-led and serving organizations, and especially for capacity building purposes, so that they can focus on their missions and uh, expanding them and scaling. Great. OK, wonderful, wonderful. Um, let's go ahead and move on. I don't know. I'm just going to call out um, another room. Um, Bradley, Christine, uh, Jasmine. Do you all want to share any themes that you all talked about? 
Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, I think I'm sorry. Come on, camera. I'll I'll go. I think uh, we talked about one one thing that one thing that um my 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 counterpart talked about was, and it stuck out to me is that you know she she said she used to say like the black the blacks more referring to black people, and that was offensive. But she said she didn't realize that that was offensive because it's a Spanish culture. That's how you say it. And mm. so I just told her, I hope she had gotten the grace that she deserved for doing that because it wasn't intentional at all, you know? And then I talked about how for me as a black person working, uh, I work with a lot of black youth and, you know, black black adults as well. And the work we do is, is outside work. Uh, we work in on different sites in and around the environment on green spaces. And the thing that I try to do is hire white people or hire, you know, all different type of cultures because I want to break the stereotype that this is black people working in the field. And yeah. so I just talked about a little bit about how that is how I try to root out racism is by changing the narrative. Uh, got it. Changing that narrative. Excellent. Thank you. Um, anyone else that wants to share or is willing to share some of the themes that you talked about? Um, I'll be willing to share for whatever reason my video won't turn on so I'm okay. sorry I, I can't yeah. join you that way um, but I was in a um, I was in a small group with Ellen I believe and we just talked about our organizations and I was telling her how um, I run this program called the Black Environmental Collective which is a network of 100 Black regional leaders who are rooted in eliminating environmental threats and hazards specifically for Black communities, which I think is rooting out racism in its own. But mm -hmm. the organization in which I'm anchored at, at the Urban Kind Institute, is a Black think and do tank. And we are trying to do everything, or most things that are the antithesis of white supremacist structures as they show up in the professional space. So perfectionism, um, one way to do things, um, those kinds of things, um, auditing people's time, um, those kinds of things we really don't try to stick to. Um, and we try to provide space and grace, knowing that we're trying to either dismantle or build, build something new or create a new pathway to something that we've otherwise, we, we otherwise don't know. So I think the whole entire organization is rooted in, um, and rooting out racism. Um, and I think mm. that's the part of our existence and it's kind of nice to be there um, because there's so many ways in which I see black people don't fit and we're not made to fit in the current systems. Um, and it's nice to be in a space where you feel like you belong. Uh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, that belonging and that connection. And then like you said, really thinking through how you um, break it down and can try to dismantle some of these systems, you know, um, and strategize about that is key. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay, well, I just want to say thank y'all for um, spending time together to, you know, talk about how you're rooting out racism, what are some of the strategies, organizations that you're a part of, and, uh, you know, I myself in terms of, um, oh, Ellen, thank you so much. Um, we see that you are back. That's, that is wonderful. And, you know, as we, as we think about um, kind of moving forward, I know I work with a lot of organizations that say that they are ready to be anti-racist, right? But then when it's really about, you know, uh, you know, me putting forth based on the data and the surveys that we do and the feedback from staff, you know, the the actual actions to step up to do that in a bold way. Um, I often find that you know CEOs, executives, senior leadership teams um, are shy of wanting to do some of that work, and so that's why I really uh, you know asked, wanted to bring today to hear from you all. You know how you are doing that, how your organizations are doing that, because some people are ready, even though they may have a statement out there, and some people are not. And I think that that's, you know, really important in terms of how we reclaim that. And so as we think about this process, um, I like the work that the Center for Creative Leadership does in terms of uh, framing. Um, a lot of times I think about the work that we need to do 
to extract racism is definitely, we all, I think we hopefully we can all agree, it is about change. And how do we um, make sure that we manage that change effectively? Um, they've got three C's. They also talk about, you know, the pathway of change leadership, the different types of people that you find within an organization that they, or that you can work with uh, based on their change style. And I think that that is also something for us to consider as well in terms of making sure that we are communicating um, and people understand the why. Uh, I think sometimes because of the, the, the work that we all do as change leaders, we're in this space constantly, some people still just don't get it. And so just making sure that we are crystal clear on the why. In addition, how we're doing that in partnership with other organizations or across departments, and then also how we continuing to model the persistence, the resilience, and stay as positive as we can, yet also keep it real and be able to, you know, be our authentic selves in this space is sometimes we, I know, a challenge, yet I also want to encourage all of us to really rise to that challenge. And so that's where um, I like this quote by Dolores Huerta. We know that she's an activist and an American labor leader, and she says, you know, we have to convince other people that they have power. It's a, it is what they can do by participating to make change, not only in their community, but many times change in their own lives. And so I think sometimes we forget that we have power and that we need to really um, own that power as well as partner with others to remind them that they have that power as well. And so it's through our power then that we continue to think about, um, you know, our questions, any final thoughts or takeaways, you know, from today's session, definitely want to hear that now um, before we get ready to close out. Any other questions or final thoughts or takeaways? And if you have resources, um, please go ahead and post those in the chat. Would love to continue to stay connected. But any questions or final thoughts or takeaways? Okay, thank you all. And so as we get ready to close, I just want to also close with another poem that I wrote in my next journal or book. Um, and again, a lot of these things are elements that we talk about around DEI or we talk about when we think about racism. And this one is called I Am Not an Acronym. From BIPOC to LGBTQIA plus to a-L-A-N-A -A to B-A-P, I am not an acronym. I am not a set of letters to be lumped together with others who may or may not share a common historical context, experience, or oppression. Furthermore, I am not an acronym. I am not to be sum summarized by a short term that reduces my power and presence yet emphasizes someone else's privilege and status. Therefore, I am not an acronym. I am amazing in my own right. My people, my heritage, and my culture deserve the 30 extra seconds to say Black, African American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native, Indigenous, Native American, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Iroquois, Cherokee, Kenyan, Senegalese, Chinese, Japanese, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, transgender, intersex, asexual, or however I choose to identify. However, I am not an acronym. See me, value me, include me, celebrate me, let me be me. I was born Mariama, M-A-R-I-A-M-A, -A -A, Saran, S-A-R-A-N, which happens to translate in some cultures to beautiful gift of G-O-D. So I am not an acronym because no gift of God should ever be reduced to a short term that reduces his, her, their power and presence, yet emphasizes someone else's privilege and status. And take enough time to learn my name, call my name, and ask M-E how I wish to I-D-E-N-T-I-F-Y. 
then maybe just maybe you'll start to see that my people, my heritage and my culture deserve the 30 extra seconds to be recognized. Finally, I am not an acronym. I am not B-I-P-O-C or L-G-B-T-Q-I-A plus or A-L-A-N-A or B-A-P. See me, value me, include me, celebrate me, let me be me. Thank you, everyone. Just want to say thank you again for our session today. Um, definitely, I'm here for another couple of moments. And I wrote that particular piece, you know, as we continue to talk about BIPOC and, and all these other terms. Um, and we know that, yes, they do place us in boxes and there are there is unity in some of that. Yet, I do also sometimes feel that majority populations um, tend to put us in those boxes and don't see us as people or as individual communities and be able to really think about what we need as individuals and what our communities need as individuals. And then also then beginning to think about the collective. So I wanna, oh, so BAP, um, Black American Princess. <laughs> That's, uh, I don't know if y'all remember that movie with Holly Berry, but, um, that's, that's what I was referring to there. And so um, just wanna say thank you for coming out today. Uh, definitely find me on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, y'all yeah, remember BAPS, absolutely. <laughs> and um, I hope that we can stay in touch. And so as change maker makers and change agents continue to stay safe, thank you for the work that you do. And I'm honored for you coming out to today's session. And that's where I really think about um, just making sure that we continue to exercise the compassion that we have towards ourselves and others so that we can really lift up DEI, equity access, you know, and the justice that we need and deserve and aspire to for our world. And, and that is a quote by me as well. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and appreciate you all so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.